Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to EE380. This is uh, Stanford University's uh, Symposium on Computer Systems. Our speaker today is Peter McMahon. He's uh, going to speak about computing with physical systems. He's a professor at uh, Cornell University and uh, spent uh, his uh, graduate years at Stanford. Uh, in any case, uh, Peter, it's all yours. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak, uh, and thanks for the, the kind introduction. Uh, EE380 was actually the very first class I took at Stanford. Uh, it was in fall of 2008, and I remember sitting in, uh, in the room at Gates where the, the seminars took place and filling in the, uh, the weekly homework of summarizing what the speaker said. Um, so it's, uh, it's very fun, fun to be back, and uh, even though it's only virtual, I hope that I, I get to come back in person at some point in the not-too-distant future, which I'm sure I will. Uh, but nevertheless, it's great to have the opportunity to share this work with uh, with everyone here virtually today. Um, and uh, the, as the, the title of the slide says, I'm going to talk about computing with physical systems and uh, maybe slightly uh, to give a slight more hint of kind of what this is going to entail is I'm going to talk about how we can try to harness physical systems that have complex dynamics and use the intrinsic computing that those systems naturally do to do useful things for us. And in particular, we're going to uh, try to train them to act as neural networks. Before I get ahead of myself, though, uh, I'm really just here to do the advertising. The, the actual work is, of course, done by the members of my group. Uh, and uh, I've listed um, at least most of the members here. And uh, the funding for this work primarily comes from NTT and, and the NSF. Uh, but uh, later on in the talk, I'll highlight uh, a couple of uh, members whose work that I'm really focusing on today. So the, the grand plan is, first of all, I think for this audience, I probably don't need to go into great detail about exactly what neural networks are, but I wanted to at least set the nomenclature uh, so that we're all on the same page about what particular terms mean. So I'll quickly go through about what neural networks are, and in particular, why and how we might want to improve their energy efficiency for inference. Then the, the meat of the talk is really going to be this middle part here of uh, this discussion of physical neural networks, of how we can build neural networks out of essentially arbitrary physical systems. There will be some caveats on the arbitrary, but to first order, how we can use arbitrary physical systems to do neural network computing for us. And then once I've shown you how we've done this and the demonstrations that we've performed so far, I'll talk a little bit about future directions that hopefully some of them appeal to uh, a computer systems audience. So maybe one of the main future directions that one can uh, can think of building off the narrative that we will set up at this, the, the first parts of the talk is how we can potentially build machine learning accelerators. Uh, and this is something that I think connects very well with uh, several previous speakers uh, already, at least in calendar 2022. I was watching some of the EE380 uh, YouTube recordings last night and saw some nice talks from uh, Grok and others on work that's happening with CMOS uh, devices that are machine learning accelerators. And I'll talk a little bit about the prospects for trying to build physical systems that are much more exotic than CMOS that might be able to compete. Uh, I'll also talk about smart sensors, which I think is a perhaps much more near-term direction of how you can do machine learning within a, a sensing device. Uh, this is maybe a little abstract, but I'll, I'll go into some detail that will hopefully make it clear. Uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, an extension of this work to, or potential extension of this work to quantum systems, and also talk about something a little more general. If uh, we figured out how to make neural networks out of arbitrary physical systems, but it turns out that we've essentially figured out a way to make arbitrary physical systems perform functions for us, and this might be useful for other things besides neural networks. So I'll also talk about that. So let's, uh, let's dive in. So first of all, I wanted to really briefly emphasize the difference between inference and training in neural networks. And the reason for this is that we're going to be focusing on inference in this talk. It's not because I don't believe training is important or because we don't have uh, work trying to uh, improve training, but the focus of the work that I'm going to tell you about today is really on inference. So just as a quick reminder, uh, inference is essentially this task of given some trained machine learning model and, for example, an image of a handwritten digit. Uh, make a prediction of what that image is. You get given this image and it makes a prediction that that was an eight. This is as opposed to training, where in training you are given some labeled data set 
Okay, for example, we're told that these are all examples of zeros and these are all examples of ones, et cetera. And given this labeled data set of handwritten images, produce a trained model. And then that trained model is the thing that gets used during inference. So we're going to focus on inference. And the reason that this is sensible is that in these cloud settings, inference cost can dominate. Uh, it can be 80 to 90% of the total dollar or energy cost of performing machine learning. And intuitively, this is because you can imagine some small engineering team maybe uses a compute cluster of reasonable size to train some model, but then once they finish training it, they deploy it to the cloud and it can get used by tens or even hundreds of millions of people. If you think of something like Google Translate, for example. And uh, this is not a number I just pulled from nowhere. Uh, this number of 80 to 90% comes from a number of sources, including Amazon and their introduction of their inference targeted uh, uh, chips a couple of years ago, uh, also from NVIDIA, also from McKinsey, et cetera. Also, just to sort of set the, set the nomenclature, not because I expect this, this audience doesn't know about neural networks, but just to make sure we're all on the same page with kind of what, term, what, what terms I'm using. Uh, a quick review of neural networks in particular. So again, if we're trying to do handwritten, uh, handwritten digit inference, we're trying to go from this input image to a prediction that this was an eight. And the most canonical straightforward diagram of a neural network doing this would be a multi-layer perceptron that's depicted here where you have multiple layers in the neural network that are each depicted by these set of circles, which are the neurons. And you can think about the information propagating through this neural network as being realized by matrix vector multiplications, where you have a vector uh, representing each layer, and then a matrix vector multiplication uh, causes the information to propagate from one layer to the next. And after this linear operation of matrix vector multiplication, you apply element-wise nonlinearity at each neuron. At least this is the most canonical form of a neural network, which will be good enough for our purposes. So now there are many different academic and commercial groups trying to build accelerators for uh, neural networks. And accelerators is sometimes a misnomer because often they're not trying to make the inference task happen faster, but they're trying to make it happen more energy efficiently, although sometimes it's also faster, but uh, in general, the, the main goal is typically to try and make inference more energy efficient. And there are essentially two philosophies about how you can go about trying to make it a hardware accelerator for, for neural networks. You can either go for an exact mathematical equivalence with the mathematical description of a neural network I just gave, or you can go for a, what I might call an approximate mathematical equivalence. And there's an asterisk here that I'll explain shortly. So. Uh, concretely, a little bit more concretely, what, what I really mean by this, well, again, this is this description of uh, the mathematical description of a canonical multi-layer teptron, where the workhorse here is a matrix vector multiplication. And this, even in more complicated neural network architectures, typically the matrix vector multiplications or vector vector dot products are the, the most uh, compute intensive part of the, the neural network inference. So an accelerator that has an exact equivalence, the goal is to try to construct a piece of hardware that will exactly implement matrix vector multiplication, where you give it a matrix, you give it a vector, and it does that. And the benefit of building such an accelerator is that now you can use this hardware as essentially a drop-in replacement for a model that was trained on a CPU or a GPU or a TPU or any other kind of ASIC that were uh, for Neumann computing device that was, uh, uh, trained under the assumption that you had matrix vector multiplications to propagate your information. The disadvantage is that making a system that performs matrix vector multiplication is it's a very specific type of operation that you're asking it to do. And so a physical system doesn't naturally just do matrix vector multiplications. So you have to really carefully engineer a device to do this. And there are people building all sorts of interesting devices, including photonic neural networks and memorist across bar arrays, as well as kind of more conventional CMOS uh, devices. Uh, but all of them have this con that because you're insisting that it exactly does a matrix vector multiplication, you have to leave some energy, you have to use some extra energy and some extra engineering effort to, to, to achieve that. And an alternative is let's make some hardware that doesn't exactly do this. It does something like this, but not exactly. And the big pro of making something that has this sort of approximate equivalence with the mathematical operation shown here is that now you can make the hardware maybe a little more sloppily. Uh, 
and it can be more energy efficient because you aren't forcing it to do something that it didn't exactly want to do to begin with. The big disadvantage of uh, building some accelerator that only has an approximate mathematical equivalence, though, is that now you need to retrain your machine learning model every time uh, you want to use this hardware because you can't just take a model that was trained, assuming this operation is the thing it does and it actually does something different. So there's a trade-off, but uh, we're interested in, well, we're, my group is interested in both parts of this trade-off, but the work I'll tell you about today is more in the sort of second category here. And the catch, or the, the asterisk, is really about, I set up this dichotomy between exact and approximate equivalence, um, but really it's even more extreme than that. We don't have to even go for an approximate equivalence. We, it turns out that we can really even just make hardware accelerators that do an operation that's kind of vaguely inspired by what happens in this canonical form. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll dive into this uh, much more deeply in the next section and show some concrete examples of this. But this is what we're about. We're trying to build hardware accelerators for machine learning, or at least one way of framing our work is, uh, or targets of our work is to try build hardware accelerators for machine learning where we have only an approximate or sort of very vaguely inspired connection with the canonical mathematics, but we still want to try to see if this works. So this, uh, this work we call physical neural networks because we're going to try to build neural networks out of physical systems. And this work was led by two postdocs in my group, Logan Wright and Tatsuhiro Onodera. And they were ably assisted by a PhD student, Martin Stein. So the, again, the goal is to try uh, build some hardware that will perform the inference task in neural networks very energy efficiently. And the intuition and the promise of trying to build neural networks out of physical systems is that many physical systems are very expensive in energy and in time to try to simulate on a digital computer. And this is because they exhibit some complex behavior. So they're intrinsically doing a lot of computing. And a very canonical example of this would be a wind tunnel. If you have uh, some car or some airplane design and uh, you want to check how well it works, you could do a simulation on a cluster of GPUs that takes minutes or hours or days, depending on how high the resolution or accuracy you want is. Or you could take that bottle car or airplane design and put it into a wind tunnel, turn the wind on, and one second later, you will have the full distribution of pressures and velocities everywhere. So there's a strong sense in which a wind tunnel is computing the Navier-Stokes equations very, very energy efficiently, uh, far more so than a digital computer could. And so the promise uh, or the thought that we had from this is, well, can you try to turn the situation around? Say, so, well, if a wind tunnel computes very this, this very complicated thing, very energy efficiently, can we somehow harness that to use and use that physical system to perform expensive computations for us besides just acting as a wind tunnel? It's clear that it can act well as a wind tunnel, but can it do some other type of computation for us? That's essentially the, uh, the intuition. And this is very much a, and kind of copying Feynman's intuition or uh, building on it for a, or adapting it to classical systems where Feynman motivated the development of quantum computers by saying that quantum systems are very difficult to simulate on classical computers. So why don't we build a computer out of quantum systems and then it should be more powerful than what we have available classically. Uh, and we are making essentially the exact same argument except we're saying, well, it doesn't even have to be a quantum system. It's difficult to simulate with a digital computer. Many classical physical systems are also difficult. The big challenge then is how do we take some arbitrary physical system that has some complex dynamics and, and make it behave as a neural network when it is some physical system that could be pretty arbitrary, like a wind tunnel that doesn't naturally look like a, a, a neural network. So that's really the, the, the challenge we set for ourselves. So we're not going to try to do arbitrary computations uh, we're not going to try to kind of make Microsoft Excel or whatever go faster. We're really going to specialize in neural networks, but still it's a less than obvious kind of how one would really go about doing this. So the way that we uh, approach this is the following. So here at the bottom is a diagram that is a slightly different drawing of something that's very standard in machine learning. This is a depiction of a several layer deep neural network for classifying a handwritten eight. And the, the diagram of the, the neural network is just a little different than we used to because now instead of drawing circles for neurons at each layer, we're just gonna have these gray boxes and each gray box represents a layer 
in the deep neural network. And into each box, <clears throat> we have an input of data and some trainable parameters. And in the case of a canonical multilayer perceptron, this gray box would be a matrix vector multiplication using the parameters. The parameters would be the elements of the weight matrix. And then uh, that would be followed by an element-wise nonlinearity. So a multilayer perceptron in this diagram's way of showing things would just be a matrix vector multiplication and element-wise nonlinearity happening in each of these gray boxes. And then eventually at the output of this network, the goal is, well, if you put it in an eight, you want it to say, well, that was an eight with high probability. So the, the twist that we decided to test was nobody said that these gray boxes had to be matrix vector multiplications and element-wise nonlinearities. That's a, it's motivated for reasonably good reason, but it's in some sense a historical accident of how artificial neural networks were developed. So that they didn't have to have that functional form. So what happens if we do something a little bit crazy? And in the, in the gray box, we put a physical system that into the physical system, we feed some data and some parameters, and we let the physical system evolve for some amount of time. And then we read out the state of the system or some part of the state of the system. And so we can, in this way, treat the physical system as performing an input output map or an implementation of a function that takes these parameters and this input data as inputs. And then it, after some amount of time, produces some set of outputs. So in an abstract sense, this physical dynamical system can produce a, it can perform a function for you. That's some, just some input output map. And we could use that function inside these gray boxes. So just with each gray box, we can replace it with a physical system. That physical system could be anything. It could be some optical setup where we have, for example, a nonlinear optical crystal and we shine laser pulses into it and it converts the colors of them. It could be some mechanical system where what's depicted here is a piece of metal being shaken on a rod. Uh, it could be some electronic system, but that's not a digital CMOS device, but some complex analog uh, nonlinear dynamical system or many other different kinds of physical system. Anything in principle is possible. So the, our kind of concept was to replace these, block, these uh, layers in neural network with physical systems and then figure out a way to train the parameters of the physical systems to see if they could be trained to perform machine learning tasks. So the, the way we went about training is that we had two key ideas. The first is that we really want to be able to use backpropagation and perform gradient descent because this has proved to be enormously successful in the conventional deep learning community. So we wanted to be able to, to leverage that. And in order to use backpropagation, uh, the, well, at least a natural way to do this is to have a digital model of your physical system so that you can have a computer compute the gradients with respect to the the function. So this first key idea is we're going to use a digital model as part of our training. And this is why I emphasized at the start of the talk, our goal is going to be to try speed up the inference. We need to be able to train the system, but the training will not necessarily receive any benefit in the way we're currently doing things here, because we're going to involve a digital computer. Then the second key idea is that if we try to train everything on a computer with a digital model, we'll find that you need to have an extremely accurate digital model, which isn't really realistic for an analog complicated physical system. And so we introduce a, a procedure that's essentially, a, it's named in homage to quantization aware training. Uh, for those of you from the neural network community that will be familiar. Uh, it's also has come up in various more spe specialized guises before, for example, chip in the loop training and so on. Uh, which we call physics aware training, where essentially the key idea is that you do the training not just with the digital model, you do a combination where you do forward pass in hardware, and then you do the backward pass in the digital model. And this makes the system robust to noise and imperfections in the model in a way that I'll show now. So to give a single layer example of how this works, uh, we have uh, some piece of training data from the training set and it's shown in red. We have some choice of the parameters shown in orange. This is fed into a physical system. The physical system forms a function on this and it gives some output. We can now feed that output into a laptop and the laptop can identify 
how wrong this output was. It knows what the target was. Let's say if we're trying to classify the handwritten digit as an eight, it should be high at eight and low everywhere else. And it wasn't quite there. So it can say, okay, well, this part was overlapping with the eight, but it's supposed to be higher and everything else is supposed to be lower. Uh, so from that, you can, it can do a subtraction and perform a computer an error vector. And then this error vector can be propagated backwards through the differentiable digital model sitting on the laptop. And, and, that, uh, and this can be done with standard PyTorch automatic differentiation tools. And that will produce gradients. So it'll tell you how you should move these parameters to try and reduce this error. And then you can update the parameters and then go through the loop again, send through the physical system. It'll hopefully have a smaller error from the target and kind of keep going and going and going. And so you trade in the loop in the standard way. And it turns out that this both works and also is, ne and also is necessary. Uh, so this uh, plot here shows accuracy as a function of the training epoch. And this was performed with a, an experimental setup uh, that used optics and it was training to perform uh, vowel, spoken vowel classification. So some relatively simple machine learning benchmark task. And what we see is that in blue, as we go through the, the training data set and we go through training the system, we get better and better accuracy. And this is using our procedure that I described here, where we do forward pass through the physical system and backward pass through the digital model. In contrast, if you try to use the laptop alone to do the training, so you do the forward pass through the digital model and the backward pass through the digital model, which we call in silico training, uh, then you, what you see is that when you run on the actual hardware, you get an answer that's no better than random guessing. So this showed that this procedure really was necessary. Uh, so it both works and is, it's important to do it this way. And it's because building physical models that exactly capture analog dynamics, even for relatively simple systems, turns out to be pretty hard. So let's now show a few more examples uh, with a slightly, slightly more complicated task. So in this case, we're, doing, we're gonna do handwritten uh, digit recognition. And the first example that I'm showing here is with a mechanical system uh, that's gonna be implemented with three layers. And the mechanical system that exists within each of the gray boxes is a piece of metal that's shown here, that's this gray square, it's a piece of titanium that gets shaken by an audio speaker. And so the input to this layer is some time domain voltage or current signal being fed to the speaker. And then the output is a recording of a microphone sitting above that metal plate. So this physical system, I hope it is clear, it was not a priori designed to perform handwritten digit classification. It seemingly has absolutely nothing to do with image classification of any type, let alone human handwritten digit classification. It's literally just a piece of metal on an audio speaker. And we constructed the three layer neural network and used the PAT training procedure to try to uh, convince the system to classify handwritten digits accurately. And what's shown at the bottom are the results, which is the confusion matrix of uh, what digit did we predict versus what was the correct answer? And if this was performing <clears throat> with 100% accuracy, you would see every element along the diagonal would be 100 and everything off diagonal would be zero. So you see that uh, it doesn't perform perfectly, but it's getting many of the digits very well, some of them a little bit less well, like 73% here. And overall, the accuracy was about 87%. So certainly by kind of standard machine learning standards, uh, even from 20 plus years ago, this is a very bad MNIST handwritten digit classifier. Still, it was a shaken piece of metal that did this, uh, that got 87% accuracy. Uh, so that was, this is not intended as a, well, we're gonna replace GPUs with shaken pieces of metal. Uh, I'll get to kind of how we, how we might think about trying to, to leverage this to, to compete against standard CMOS in neural network accelerators, this was meant more as a demonstration that a really obscure piece of physical hardware can actually perform a pretty standard machine learning task. We did the same thing with an electronic system, but not a CPU or a GPU or even a CPU from 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. 
an extremely simple circuit. So this circuit is shown here on a breadboard, the circuit diagram is here. It's an RLC circuit, so an RLC oscillator with one transistor added in. And the purpose of the added transistor is to provide nonlinearity because an RLC circuit is at least in the idealized case linear. And we know from the standard machine learning literature that uh, nonlinearity is extremely important in neural networks. But this is a very simple circuit by computer standards. And you can see that from the photograph, this was constructed in uh, my postdoc Logan's apartment during the pandemic lockdown. This is, uh, I don't think he will be offended if I say, it looks kind of like a middle schooler's first attempt at a circuit. And it was purposefully so. We did not carefully engineer the circuit to do machine learning. We just built a very simple circuit that was supposed to have relatively complex time dynamics. And then we wanted to see if we could use it to perform machine learning. And in this case, it was again, a three layer neural network that was implemented. Uh, this time, instead of just one copy of the neural network, Logan made seven copies of it and then averaged the results. Um, and this, uh, this circuit has complex enough dynamics that this actually worked. This achieved accuracy of uh, a little bit over 90%. Uh, so it's actually surprisingly good considering it's just got one transistor. And then a final example is we used a nonlinear optical system where it was a nonlinear optical crystal that we shine pulses of laser light through where the pulses are short in time, so they're broad in frequency, and we encoded the parameters in the data in the frequency domain or the wavelength domain of the pulse. And then this crystal convert takes uh, pairs of photons and you can think about them kind of mushing them together and producing one single photon that is at the sum of the energies of the two input photons. And so it performs a relatively complex operation of, uh, of taking all these different combinations of pairs of photons and summing them together and then producing a new a uh, spectrum of color out. So we have a spectrum of light going in and a spectrum of light that we can measure as the output. Uh, and in this case, we performed a two, two physical layers with this as well as a digital layer on a laptop. Uh, and in this case, we're able to achieve 97% accuracy on this MNIST handwritten digit classification task. I'm gonna pause briefly there. So Dennis's video is turned on and I'm curious if he has a question. No, I'm just uh, playing. <laughs> Very good. Um, incidentally, if anyone has any questions at any time, please do feel free to interrupt. So th these three demonstrations are demonstrations of the basic concept that we can take very not carefully designed for machine learning physical systems and convert them into things that actually perform machine learning for us. Uh, how you feed the pictures, actually pixels here in that uh, models? Right. Yeah, so it's a great question. So how do we encode the image data into these physical systems? And uh, I guess simultaneously, I can also answer how do we put the parameters in? So it, the input data is, uh, you can think about it as a 2D image. It's just you can flatten it, and it becomes a 1D vector of numbers. And in the case of the optical system, we fed the image in conceptually as uh, a part of the frequency spectrum. So the frequency spectrum is, well, it's the x-axis is wavelength or frequency, so it's a one-dimensional thing. And we can just say, well, part of that spectrum uh, is where we're going to take the flattened eight uh, image and encode that into that part of the spectrum. Uh, in the case of the electronics and the mechanics, uh, both of them were done very similarly, is that you have some time-varying voltage or current waveform and you can again take your flattened image vector, you, you made it into a 1D vector, and then you can feed it in as a voltage as a function of time. Uh, so one more question about uh, mm -hmm. the encoding. So is the flattening just doing just down like pixel by pixel and line by line, or is it uh, or is it using some like locality preserving order or something more sophisticated, like something more, more even more complicated? We tried a bunch of different things. I think in the end, um, the, the way things were done was with patches. So there's some notion of locality preserving maybe in your nomenclature of we didn't just go row by row. Um, because 
from kind of reasonable intuition, uh, it, it, it's more important to have the sort of things that are spatially nearby within 2D than the stuff that's far apart in one dimension. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. I think I missed something basic, which is how do you adjust, adjust the parameters given the error vector? How do you know which parameters to adjust and how? Sure. So the way that this works is uh, through this training procedure where we send some data with some choice of parameters through the physical system. It computes that you now compute an error vector on a laptop. And then this error vector gets sent through a differentiable digital model. So we literally use the standard machine learning uh, software, PyTorch, to do this. Um, and this, uh, the, the PyTorch uh, different order differentiation tool will compute the gradients for us. So we give it a model of the system uh, that is differentiable. We give it the error vector and it will tell us the gradient. And then we can say, okay, let's take the parameters we had and add the gradient to it so that it, uh, we, it's adjusted and then we feed it back into the system again. Did that make what sense? do you do in case of multi-layers, multiple mm -hmm. layers? Right. So this, uh, this example here is shown as just a single layer for essentially ease of illustration purposes. This naturally generalizes to multiple layers, though, in much the same way that uh, automatic differentiation training or uh, backprop training uh, extends to multiple layers in the case of conventional uh, artificial neural networks. Yes, thank you. Great, thanks. So a natural question one might ask after seeing this is like, well, we shook a metal plate and it managed, we managed to train it to classify 108 digits. Is why does this work? Why does using a continuous time dynamical system as the neural network work? Why does replacing these gray block boxes with physical systems function? And essentially, I can give some intuition that is inspiration from the so-called neural ODE literature, which is actually something that was inspirational in the development of this project in the first place. It's not an explanation we came up with after the fact. It's something that it inspired us to try to begin with. And there's a very, very interesting uh, essentially set of results at this point about deep, neuro deep artificial neural networks, uh, where, for example, you have something like ResNet, from 2015, where it achieved state-of-the-art performance on ImageNet, but it did so with a very deep network. And a bunch of people got thinking about this. One of them was Wine and E. Uh, and I think the, the thought process was, it's kind of interesting that if you take a, deep, a, a few layer neural network and you make it deeper, it gets better. And then you make it deeper, it gets better. And then you make it even deeper and it gets even better. And then there's some catches of you have to put skip connections in to deal with vanishing gradients and so on. But uh, to first order, the message of deep learning is that deeper is better. Uh, they looked at this and said, this is kind of interesting that as you go deeper and you add more and more discrete steps, uh, that things get better and better. And you know what that reminds one of? That reminds one of uh, dynamical systems and uh, numerical solving of ODEs or PDEs, where if you discretize with some big time step and you only have a few time steps, you don't get a very accurate answer. But if you make the time step smaller and smaller and smaller, you get more and more accurate answers. And uh, Wine and E and others managed to show that actually ResNet, you can model this as a discretization of a continuous time dynamical system. Uh, so there's a sense in which ResNet is really a discretization of something that's underlying is actually continuous. And so this was very inspirational to us because we said, well, if, if that's true, then why instead of making a digital system that discretizing, discretizes everything in time, why don't you build a physical system that is continuous time in the first place? Um, and we didn't end up doing exactly that. So this connection between discretization uh, of dynamical systems being what some artificial neural networks, at least like ResNet are, and the actual dynamical systems we use is just intuition or inspiration um, because we didn't actually make a dynamical system that actually had exactly this ODE. Uh, but 
it shows an example, at least, of why a continuous time dynamical system or a way in which it can actually be, in some sense, the same as a, as a conventional uh, state-of-the-art deep, uh, deep neural network. So I think this is a, a really nice connection that uh, that is uh, both motivated us, but is also nice as, a, as some intuition for why this is even not a totally crazy thing to have, ha have had happened, that we can do it aimless with these these three totally different dynamical continuous time dynamical systems and it actually works so another natural thing to wonder is okay these three physical systems e each of them were pretty rudimentary the optics one less so than the, the mechanics and the electronics but what what else might you try to do this with and so we're very interested in figuring out what are good physical systems to do this with um, and you there are many people working on neuromorphic computing with Spintronic nano oscillators, for example, and I think this could be a very interesting platform to try this with. Um, similarly, there are many people thinking about superconducting circuits in the classical domain uh, and using those for neuromorphic computing, and we can imagine trying to uh, build physical neural networks out of these. You can also imagine somewhat more exotic things. If you take some material system, for example, some 2D material heterostructures, and you have uh, you can uh, in inject photons into them and make where well, you can shine photons on them and generate excitons. And these excitons can have some complex dynamics. And you can imagine trying to harness these complex dynamics in a in a quantum material to uh, to perform machine learning for you. And it could really be any physical system. So uh, I think when I give this talk to applied physics or physics audiences, I really emphasize if you have a physical system that's hard to simulate on your laptop and you would like to try turn it into a neural network, feel free to give it a try. We put our code on GitHub, or you're welcome to contact us. Um, so if it happens to be anybody who in the audience today who's a physicist or applied physicist or works with some hard to simulate physical system and you want to give this a go, uh, please feel free to reach out, but also uh, you can also just try it with the, with the open source code we put out. So that is a... Uh, a kind of natural sig into well what are some future directions besides well let's try it with other different physical systems and as physicists we can certainly have fun with that but what are some application directions for this uh, so now i'm going to talk about a few in the last uh, sort of 10 or so minutes of uh, what are the ways or at least what are the one way we can imagine building uh, large-scale optical accelerators or accelerators using optics that might eventually be competitors to cpus or gpus or tpus as neural network inference engines um, i'll describe smart sensors which is a, a catch-all phrase for devices where you're trying to sense something about the environment and you want to you do some machine learning within the hardware itself before you send it off to a computer uh, I think it's a very interesting extension of this work to, to quantum systems. And then there's something that's really not connected with machine learning at all, but that we can try to leverage our physics-aware training procedure to let physical devices be trained to perform new functions. So let's start off with uh, photonic neural networks or optical neural networks. And uh, there's a, I'm personally very interested in the, pr the prospect for optics to be used to construct machines that can outperform CMOS electronics uh, at neural network inference. I think it's an extremely difficult goal because CMOS has had so many years of development and so much money put into the development. But from a physics basis, there is a reason to believe that one could achieve this. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting research topic. So in, in my own lab, we've been working on uh, optical neural networks where we uh, are working in the spatial domain. So we encode vectors into uh, beams of light that we can fan out and make copies of. We then uh, perform uh, element-wise multiplications using spatial light modulators and then uh, can uh, uh, perform, uh, essentially perform vector vector dot products where uh, the, the sum and the vector vector dot product happens by just multiple beams of light being collapsed onto a single detector. Uh, and this is just one example of a photonic neural network. There are many other approaches people are, uh, are um, pursuing at the moment, including both commercially and, and academia. Uh, but in our case, one of the things that we've recently worked on that I think uh, is at least suggestive of the potential for optical neural networks is that we managed to show MNIST handwritten digit classification using less than a single photon per scalar multiplication. Uh, so that's this red highlighted box here is really the highlight of this figure. We're showing the accuracy of MNIST handwritten digit classification as a function of how many photons were used in the processor. And at first glance, this might seem a little crazy. How can you 
perform a multiplication using less than a photon? How do you even encode the information in less than a photon? And essentially the, the trick is that you're performing vector vector dot products where you're summing over many scalar multiplications. And so you have a lot of noise when you use this few photons per multiplication, but when you sum over many of them, the, the noise gets averaged down. And so overall this, this ends up working. And if we look towards the future, we and others have been doing projections of uh, how big would you have to make an optical neural network to actually outcompete a GPU or a TPU or some other CMOS device. And it turns out that in the case of, for example, transformer models for language, uh, for natural language processing, uh, there is a crossover point and there's certainly sort of reasonable size models where you could imagine getting several orders of magnitude uh, energy efficiency improvements, even when you bake in the costs of not just the photons, but all the electronic infrastructure around the optical neural network itself. Like you have detectors that are electronic, they, they have to have ADCs and these DACs and so on. Um, but even when you account for all of that, if you make the system big enough, uh, you can really uh, foresee a, a future where you get an energy advantage. And the reason for this is uh, maybe a little bit glibly that uh, optical neural networks have the potential to do n squared operations uh, in optics where you only have to pay an order n energy cost to get the data in and out. And so if you make, uh, you have a lot of constant factors, but if you make things big enough, the n, uh, the n squared in electronics ends up dominating and uh, the n in uh, optics based systems can, uh, can end up if, even in kind of absolute terms, end up winning in energy efficiency. So I think this is a very interesting direction um, and uh, there's a lot of people working on this and this uh, general approach of trying to take a complex optical system and, and get it to do machine learning for you, I think is, uh, is going to be something that we, we in my group uh, play with a lot over the next couple of years. Another direction that uh, is somewhat related to the previous slide, but uh, is more general, is the notion of smart sensors. And so an example of this is in, it's inspired by uh, kind of human systems is that if you think about the optical bandwidth going into the, the data rate going into the human eye, at least I didn't calculate this. Somebody calculated that this is apparently about 10 megabits per second of data. Um, but the human brain is actually only processing at about 100 bits per second. So what's, what's going on? Well, it turns out that there's some very serious kind of compression stage that's going on at the beginning before you get to the neural network stage, if you will. Um, and this has inspired uh, a thought from our side, which is if you have some physical system that you can train, uh, you can send some physical object or signal into this physical system and train that physical system to perform some transformation for you that effectively does this kind of compression from 8.75 megabits per second down to 100 bits per second. And then you perform some transduction and ADC and digital processing afterwards. So you can use a physical system to basically do compression for you in some sense, but not a general purpose compression like a GZIP, but a neural network compression dedicated specifically to the task you're trying to do. And so this physical object or data could be photons, like in the case of kind of human eye, but this could also be fluid flow, it could be literal molecules, it could be acoustic waves, it could be mechanical forces. And this processing of this physical system, we're imagining that this is in the same domain. So if we're talking about photons going in, then this physical system should be some optical system. But if it's some fluid flow, then this might be some literally some fluid liquid system. Uh, if it's acoustic waves, this could be something like our mechanical plate on a speaker again. And uh, as a concrete example of this, we've recently been working on uh, doing real scene imaging where we have some 3D printed car scene with stop signs and so on, where we send this through a multiple layers of optical uh, transformations that we then train, uh, where the goal is to try to get the, the whole visual scene down into just a few pixels on a camera. Um, and you really force a strong bottleneck there. Uh, and the big benefit of this in principle is that you can now have the camera go at much, much higher frame rates than were possible otherwise, because if you insisted on taking a 10 megapixel image, uh, you, you're going to be stuck to some number of tens of hertz frame rates, uh, maybe a bit higher, but you're not going to be able to get to gigahertz. But if you 
are able to perform optical pre-processing to get to a point where you now have only, uh, let's say, four pixels here. Now you can run these four pixels at a gigahertz. Uh, so this is, I think, is a, a, a very nice example of how kind of doing processing in the physical domain of the data that you've, you, you got in the first place could actually give you a practical benefit. And it's something that's not really comparable to a GPU or a TPU. It couldn't have done this because you can't just put a GPU in here before you have your camera. Uh, the GPU can only come afterwards. Mm -hmm. So another uh, future direction that I think is... Uh, really interesting and ties a lot with my background of in, in quantum computing is you know, quantum physical neural networks. So there are many people interested in quantum neural networks. Uh, and you can see this goes back to at least the early 90s of people proposing quantum versions of neural networks. But there's been a renaissance of this over the last five or so years. This is just paper from 2018. It's just one of many examples of neural network papers that people have proposed on a quantum computer running a series of quantum gates where the gates are parameterized by some angles, for example. And uh, these are the tunable parameters of your neural network. And you fiddle with the angles and the quantum circuit such that you train the circuit to give an output that it says an eight when you put in an eight, an, an image of an eight and so on. Uh, and this has been generalized to uh, sort of quantum circuit learning where you can imagine gener generic circuits of a uh, quantum circuit where you have some input encoding and then some uh, programmable unitary that has programmable parameters that you train to, to perform whatever task you want. And the, the kind of key thing of all these things that have come up in the last, or almost all of the literature in the space that's come up over the last few years, people want to, use, to do this on standard circuit model quantum computers like Google and IBM and others are building. But our thought is the following, is that what if we adapt our procedure that, uh, uh, that I showed earlier for classical systems. And instead now of a physical system that is some very weird classical system, like a shaken piece of metal, what if we now, instead of putting a, instead of using a quantum computer, we take some quantum system that is not well calibrated, it's dissipative potentially, um, it's definitely not on its own a quantum computer, but it's still a system that behaves according to the, the laws of quantum mechanics and is not trivially classical can we somehow turn that into a useful quantum neural network? And I think if we use this procedure, we should be able to. And in this case, well, what would the differentiable digital model be? How would we do that? Well, if the system's big enough, you'll probably need to actually use a standard circuit model quantum computer to do this. Um, so we think this is an interesting direction as well. Can we turn badly designed quantum systems into useful neural networks, potentially using standard quantum computers for doing the training? And then a final direction that I wanted to mention was uh, beyond machine learning, what could this be good for? In some strong sense, physics-aware training is letting us train a physical piece of hardware to perform a particular function. And the function we're choosing is essentially the, the feed-forward function of a neural network, but it doesn't have to be that. So as an example, imagine we want to perform, we want to make a filter and we want to perform some filter function. Um, and the conventional approach to doing this would be you define your filter and you say, well, this is, these, this is the cutoff frequency I want and this is the 3dB bandwidth and so on. This is the center frequency. Uh, and a, a circuit designer goes off and uses the known building blocks and filter design theory and simulations and so on to design some CMOS circuit that will do this. But using the physical neural networks and physics-aware training approach, you can imagine doing this in a completely different way, which is that you can take some material or device that has tunable parameters, and you can train those parameters such that the material or device performs this input-output map that you, you wanted from whatever you designed, which could have been a filter. And so what, what are some materials or devices you might do this with? One of the things that we're actually playing with is networks of oscillators. So if you imagine having a bunch of oscillators that are coupled in some tunable way, uh, and these are nonlinear oscillators, and you can, you can program how strongly they're coupled to one another. You can imagine tweaking these parameters such that given whatever RF input signal you put into one of the oscillators, you can make the RF output signal, maybe not anything you want, but some large set of possible functions can be applied to it. And this could also be some, uh, some more exotic thing like a a quantum material uh, that you could maybe have source and gate and drain voltages on and uh, that you could fiddle uh, fiddle with the parameters of voltages applied to the material and see what uh, input output relations it's able to represent. 
So with that, I will uh, put up a summary. Uh, so basically I've shown how we can use uh, uh, a training procedure that we've designed, physics aware training to harness the computation the physical systems naturally do to perform machine learning for us. And we've demonstrated this procedure with three different types of system, a mechanical one, an electrical one, and an optical one. Uh, and we've shown it on a relatively simple task of MNIST handwritten digit classification, but hopefully that proof of principle is inspirational about what else we could do with this. And I think there are many interesting future directions to take this uh, line of work, including trying to figure out how to scale to large, large scale devices that could potentially actually beat uh, CMOS processors, but as well as things where we're not directly competing with GPUs, for example, in smart sensors or building quantum physical neural networks out of systems that are not well-designed quantum computers, as well as uh, trying to endow uh, materials and devices with new functionality that they didn't otherwise have. Uh, so with that, I'll leave it there. And uh, I'm very happy to, to stick around with questions, but thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, for the questions so far, and again, the invitation to speak. Uh, did you try to use uh, an optical device with some kind of controllable uh, shadow on the picture? Uh, the reason for that because uh, I'm surprised uh, your first experiments about uh, when you feed the picture through linear row, that it gets some uh, positive results with very good accuracy. Uh, usually, uh, neural networks actually has a need to have a close relationship adjacent pixels to make a good recognition. Uh, because when pixels are located far away, it's uh, the influence through system need to, you need to have many, many layers to get that influence, all right? So in case of optical, it's much easy because you have a, a regular optic or a regular picture. And you may try to make a matrix of uh, uh, controllable shadow as a, uh, as a uh, vectors uh, for correction, for training. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the uh, examples that I showed over here, uh, I think in the end for each of these ones, we ended up doing things with patches because like you said, if you just flatten the neural network into 1D, um, it will work, but it won't work very well. I think to get the results that we showed here, we did the slightly more sophisticated thing of, of sort of flattening into patches so that you preserve some of the locality. Um, in the case, and in, in all three examples, including the optical case here, we were going from 2D into 1D because the encoding in the optics case was in the frequency domain, which only has one dimension. But in the case of uh, this other work that we've done on optical neural networks, you literally do feed just the image into the system and it makes multiple copies of it and then you can perform these uh, the weight multiplications in element element wise fashion but here we're not flattening into 1d and this is indeed a place where you could imagine putting a, a mask in front of the image over here for example to essentially I, I guess it identifies features in some sense um, that's not something we've done but uh, i agree it's something that a principal one could do we what we've done is uh is do this in multiple layers we to achieve these results this was with mnist we did three layers of the neural network and it was possible to to achieve reasonable accuracy um with three layers so we didn't need to play any extra tricks but indeed we did have to have multiple layers to get it to work because with just one layer it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be able to achieve this accuracy at least you probably need to also to think about loops in regular uh neural networks models right now it's very popular to have uh, some uh, bypass of information, and uh, that's the reason to get uh, influence uh, uh, mixing uh, uh, mixing information from first layer to later layers. That's right. These skip connections are, are very common in a number of different architectures. So I guess there are two things I can say about that. One is that. Uh, there's some sense in which the continuous time dynamical systems are intrinsically doing this. This is this really nice proof from Wine and E and others uh, showing that a continuous time system, at least some particular continuous time system, you can really think about it as, as doing this, this discrete neural network that has the skips. Um, that's maybe a little bit too glib though. I think we have we haven't in uh, this work demonstrated ones where we put skip connections in, but in principle we could. 
Um, there's nothing stopping us from, uh, from programming in Skip Connections, either physically or in a laptop. But the other thing I could say is that uh, we've been very interested in transformers, and the transformer models are, um, where is it, over here, uh, ones where there's less of the Skip Connection business, which is maybe a little bit more natural for optics where you really want to, uh, at least if you're trying to do everything as op with as much optics and as little electronics as possible, it's it's helpful to avoid the skips. But uh, uh, it's it's still possible to do it so long as if you're going into electronics afterwards, uh, before the next layer, you can store things in a little bit of electronic memory and and be able to kind of yeah introduce the skip in the in the laptop. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, one more question about uh, the encoding. I'm very interested in that, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, how, how, how many different, just curious, how many different kind of encodings did you try? Because I wonder if you have ever tried a space filling curve, like a fractal, and I, I wonder if, the, if that would do anything to, to the performance. That's an interesting question. I don't think we've tried any any fractal one. It's an interesting thought though. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, it might be better. We should give it a go. Yeah, because it sounds to be like a fractal preserving the locality in kind of like different different scales, right? Is that right, right. you have that curious, curious uh, char characteristic? Right. Okay, yeah. So no, that's it's an interesting what... suggestion. I, I, I don't really have much to say other than we should probably give it a try because I, it's possible that, like, like I said at the start, I'm not the one who personally does the work, but I don't remember the postdocs or students telling me about them trying that. So probably we haven't. Either that or my memory is bad or both. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And uh, I have another question. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think it's, it's possible to, so, so, so the example you are going to give you are computing like either over a fixed size vector or you are just computing a stream of like a stream of scalar value or a, or like again like a vector value uh, over time it i wonder if it, is it possible to like compute on the normal uh, the data structure in the normal sense in computer science which which are maybe graph or trees and they are highly irregular and they might be the and they might have a like much bigger size than the than the internal state vector of your physical system. Because uh, if I'm going to, uh, so if, if you think about an analogy, uh, currently, is, is, at least the examples I'm seeing, it seems that it is like computing with a register machine and with, with only a fixed number of registers with that, and without an like, external memory. And I wonder the, if, if there's an analog of a, the, uh, of a random access uh, machine to to this like physical computing system. Right. Yeah, that, that, that's a very interesting set of points. Um, so the first thing I should say is in all three three examples, we were using fixed size essentially arrays or vectors that we're feeding into the system. Um, and in principle, you can make something that actually works on streaming data. And we've thought a little bit about this and. We haven't yet published any experiments on it, but we've we've certainly done some simulations and thought about it of what about designing some dynamical system where you continuously feed a time series into it and it just it never ends and it keeps continually performing some task on that. Uh, and that's also possible. Um, the point about memory is very astute. Um, this these physical systems currently we're kind of limited in how much data we can put into them both data data and parameters um, because they don't have directly connected to them some memory we, we just have a computer with some memory and then we're feeding it in via essentially uh, some transducer uh, and that is a pretty severe limitation on scaling these to really large sizes. So one of the things we're really trying to push towards when you go to, for example, an optical neural network is thinking, how can you make this thing as big as possible? Um, and in optics, it turns out that it seems pretty reasonable to go pretty big. Why? Because we can have a like a 10, 10 megapixel image that we project onto some crystal. So we can get at least... 10 million data points in every time we can flash that image on. Um, there's still uh, a, a bunch of uh, tricky business though, because, well, you can do that 
at maybe 10 hertz, but what about if you want to go to gigahertz? Uh, so you need to try to be a little careful with things, and it's very analogous to things that are happening in the CMOS neural network uh, accelerator community because they have a very similar problem of uh, you, neural networks work better and better if you have more and more parameters. So you want to have as many parameters as possible. They can't necessarily all stay within the on-chip memory, and it's very expensive to move things on and off uh, the chip. So what do you do? Well, you try to design things where you, you reuse the weights as much as possible. And um, in the case of optics, you try to fan out the data optically, which is free in optics, but not in electronics. Um, but it's a pretty difficult systems engineering challenge because you, at least in a physical system, you don't naturally have a memory. So you, you have to somehow find a way to take advantage of things either being static or taking advantage of memories that are outside the system. And another final thought on that is, there's some physical systems where you can imagine the physical system itself having memory, like you shine light on a crystal and it heats part of it up. So it sort of remembers what happened before. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting direction to try and figure out how to harness that. We don't exactly know how to use that to our benefit yet, but it seems in principle like this kind of thing where physical systems have a memory of what happened to them um, could be useful beyond just, well, in a recurrent neural network, you want memory because we know how to do that. But to do it in the sense you're talking about uh, probably requires more work. I see. Thank you. Yeah, very inspiring. This is a great, great question. So thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I wonder how uh, how's the system um, behave when the pre in the presence of maybe noise or device mismatches? Because I I I'm, I, I'm, I think there must be some like you know uh, non ideality happen inside those. A mechanical system or optic systems or or either electronic system. I wonder like how large does it affect the training accuracy? Maybe like does the training accuracy the same every time you run the, the with the same uh, parameters, or or mm. does the noise like affect the the the, the results? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So essentially, the biggest challenge we had in this project was trying to deal with making a training procedure that was resilient to the noise because the model inaccuracy slash the noise you have really destroys things if you only train on the laptop, which is what was shown in the black here. If you train on the laptop, the laptop tells you, yeah, I trained it great. You should get 90% accuracy. And then you run it on the actual physical hardware and you get no answers, no better than random guessing. And this is because the model in the laptop was different than the physical thing. And so it went to, the model and laptop went off into some weird part of parameter space where it said, this should be giving you a good answer and then you run it on the hardware and it's actually different. Um, and so that was really what motivated us to do this loop where we have the physical hardware in the loop. And then it turns out to be pretty good. And you can wonder then why is this succeeding? Why is this resilient to noise? And it's one of the intuitions is that because during the training procedure, it's subject to the noise, it more or less learns to not go into parts of parameter space that are very sensitive to the noise, because if you do that, then you'll get bad, you'll get bad errors. Um, so the, this procedure is robust. There is a catch, which is once you've done the training and you now have your parameters, if your physical system changes and you then try to run again, you're not going to get good results. So these results, some of these took a few days to collect. Um, so these physical systems were like the training procedure was robust to the variation you have over days. Now, if we try to do it again on some of these, uh, especially the, the optics one, I think like a year later, it's probably not going to be very good. The mechanics one actually, uh, th this can be, can be revived pretty easily. So this one actually stays, uh, stays the same for uh, at least months. Um, but uh, it depends on the physical system because you do need you do require that like the, the the physical system perform roughly the same function between when you trained it and when you want to use it. I see. Yeah, that that makes sense. Like yeah, in the training, kind of ex explicitly consider the noise in the right. training process. Okay. Right. And Thanks. another cool interpretation of what's going on here is why does this work when the model isn't exactly right? Is that the gradient only has to be in the right direction. If the gradient is in the correct direction for each value in the parameters, then it will make progress. 
if the if the model was so inaccurate versus the physical system itself that the gradients were coming out to be the wrong direction, then you would not be able to train because it would never go. It would never yeah it would never move in the right direction. But so long as the model is close enough to the physical system that the gradients sort of have the right sign, then it makes progress. And we quantified how inaccurate the model can be and have this thing still work. And it turns out that you can have model misspecification mismatch of ugh, tens of percent. And it's still, it still is okay. I see. Then uh, we'll expect that if, if, if we're going to move this uh, methodology to sensor, smart sensor, will, do you think it will like, become worse? Because I would imagine, for example, for optic systems, like uh, in, in your normal training scheme, you're going to provide like lasers. But if you put it on the sensors, those light up become more like less, like the noise inside the, those uh, uh, lights become like, uh, a larger portion of that, I would right. imagine. That. Yeah, so there's, I think always with these going to be a trade-off of how much robustness you want to the system and how long you want it to last and so on versus how much energy efficiency you want it to have. So in our work on smart sensors for imaging, uh, we've does, we've, we haven't taken some completely random optical system and tried to use that. We tried to engineer an optical system that would be relatively stable. Uh, and not use it with light that was super sensitive to a lot of parameters. But we paid a, a price, an engineering price in that of now our system won't be as energy efficient uh, or as low cost as it could have could have been. So I think there's always going to be with these a trade off. If you take literally a shaken piece of metal, it's sort of like the minimum cost, but uh, it's maybe not as robust as if you carefully design it. And there's always, you need to pick where you want to be in that continuum. Like another example would be sort of a, TPUs, CMOS layout versus randomly scattered transistors. Um, those are the two extremes, but you can imagine kind of things in the middle where you're uh, where, where you're getting more benefit, but now you're insisting on uh, on more. Uh, or if you, you want more robustness, you have to lose a little bit in the energy efficiency. I see. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, we always need to do some trade off, like for energy and and accuracy. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Another concrete example of that is like in, in this work here, we were doing pixel to pixel mapping where literally one pixel is going through one pixel, going to one pixel. TNU did an amazing job aligning five, more than 500,000 pixels to be exactly matched with each other. But it turns out that, yeah, that's pretty hard to do. But you can imagine making a system that's more dense and more energy efficient if you don't insist on doing that. Now you try to kind of compensate for the aberrations that happened. Uh, in principle, you could use the PAT strategy to try to compensate for things. And in, But the benefit you get is now the system can be smaller. I see. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for, 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 for the explanation. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to thank everyone again for, well, all the questions I did receive so far and, uh, and for your attention uh, throughout the talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great talk. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate the invitation. Really great uh, a piece of work, and uh, it's going to see practical application all over everywhere, I think. I'm hopeful we'll, we'll, we'll see at least academic application, and if we're really lucky, practical application. I'll be very excited if it makes it into the real world. <laughs> okay. In any case, thank you very much for the talk, and we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dennis. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye.